In August 1958, the Advanced Research Projects Agency authorized Headquarters Air Research and Development Command to proceed with the development of an oxygen-hydrogen upper-stage rocket vehicle, which would use the Atlas missile as booster. Following this authorization, the commander ARDC assigned overall program management responsibility to the Special Project Office under the Deputy Commander for Weapon Systems. On October 17th, a contract was awarded by ARDC to Pratt & Whitney Aircraft for development of the engine package. On November 19th, ARDC issued a contract to General Dynamics Corporation, Convair Astronautics, for development of the upper stage. With these contracts, the development work on Project Centaur was started. Convair Astronautics was assigned the task of overall upper stage system integration, development of the entire two-stage vehicle, and flight testing. The engineering department moved immediately to the task beginning with preliminary design, which was based on extensive mission and system analysis. An astronautics project office was formed to coordinate progressive stages in development. This development is combining proven design with recent advancements in rocket technology. Mr. Kraft Araki, program director for Convair Astronautics, can best describe the vehicle and its capabilities. Since the end of World War II, Pioneer work has been done with liquid hydrogen on a laboratory scale in small rocket engines and in jet engines by the Navy, the former NACA, and the Air Force. At the Convair Division of General Dynamics, we have studied since 1956 oxygen-hydrogen-powered upper stages for the Atlas vehicle. The Centaur is the high-energy upper stage of a two-stage space vehicle which uses the Atlas as booster in order to launch a payload into orbital altitude. The primary purpose of the Centaur is to deliver a communication satellite into a 24-hour orbit at about 19,300 nautical miles altitude. In the field of space research, the Centaur can carry considerable payloads to the moon and to the planets, and therewith opens the entire inner solar system to space research. In order to be able to accommodate the Centaur vehicle, we must make a few changes on the Atlas booster itself. We will remove the conical front end of the present Atlas tank and replace it by a cylindrical section. The modified Atlas booster is connected with the Centaur vehicle by means of an adapter section. And atop the entire vehicle sits the payload itself. This, then, is the Atlas Centaur space vehicle. This picture shows you a cutaway view of the Centaur mounted on the Atlas booster vehicle. Now, let us take a more close-up view of the Centaur vehicle itself. The Centaur vehicle is powered by two engines of 15,000 pounds thrust each, using oxygen and hydrogen. The liquid hydrogen is stored in the forward tank, which has a capacity of approximately 5,000 pounds. The oxygen is stored in the small rearward tank with a capacity of 21,000 pounds liquid oxygen. The main engines can be restarted several times following coasting under weightless, weightless conditions in, in an orbit. In order to effect the restart, we have special starter engines, four hydrogen peroxide-powered engines of 50 pounds thrust each, yielding a total thrust of 200 pounds. In addition to these small engines, we have two clusters of three attitude control engines each, micro-thrust engines of about two pounds thrust so that we can control the attitude of the vehicle in pitch, yaw, and roll. Up front, on top of the hydrogen tank, is a payload section. Payload section and hydrogen tank have to be protected from aerodynamic heating while the vehicle ascends through the denser atmosphere into space. The payload section is protected by a low-drag nose fairing the hydrogen tank is protected by an insulation 
layer. After we have left the aerodynamically effective atmosphere, that is, approximately shortly after staging of the two booster engines of Atlas, we are jettisoning the insulation as well as the nose fairing. Now, no matter what the space mission of this vehicle will be, it will always first ascend into a low-altitude circular orbit, approximately 100 miles high. We call this orbit a parking orbit, and it serves as a springboard for the vehicle deeper into space after it has, after coasting for a while in the parking orbit, achieved the right departure position. So we have a standard ascent into this parking orbit, which is depicted in this graph here. The vehicle ascends vertically, of course, with all three booster engines blazing. After 142 seconds, and after we have reached an altitude of about 31 nautical miles, the two booster engines will be dropped, and the vehicle will continue its flight under the power of the single Atlas sustainer engine. Now the entire propellant of the Atlas booster is consumed, the Atlas is jettisoned, and the Centaur continues the powered flight with its own two engines and ascends further until approximately 480 seconds after takeoff. It has reached in horizontal flight a velocity of 25,500 feet per second at an altitude of 100 nautical miles. The vehicle is now in the parking orbit. From this orbit now, the vehicle might climb via an elliptic ascent orbit into circular orbits at higher altitudes. The following picture shows you the payloads which the vehicle can carry into orbits at altitudes which are given in thousands of miles here along the abscissa. Two curves are shown. The upper blue curve refers to launchings due east from the Atlantic Missile Range in Florida. The yellow curve refers to launchings due south into a polar orbit from the Pacific Missile Range, Point Agrello. You can see that for lower altitude orbits around 500 to 1,000 miles, we can carry payloads between 8 and 9,000 pounds. The payload now drops rather quickly in the first portion of the graph. At 7,500 miles, in which a satellite would require 8 hours to circumnavigate the Earth once, we would still, however, have approximately 3,000 pounds of payload available. The payload now drops more slowly, and in the 24-hour orbit, depending on its orbital inclination, that means depending on whether it is an equatorial orbit or one that is inclined by about 28 degrees with respect to the equator, we can carry approximately between 1,300 and 1,800 pounds of payload. The green dot here shows you that we can launch to Mars under the constellation conditions that exist in 1960, a payload of approximately 13 to 1400 pounds. However, space explorations will not be done until we have first established a number of satellites required for national defense and security. Once we get ready to use the Centaur for space exploration, we will not be limited to simple flights to Mars only. As I pointed out before, we can cover the entire inner solar system. In the center of the solar system, we have the Sun, the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. This line here depicts a transfer orbit from Earth to Mars with radar and television connection between the probe and Earth. Another orbit that we can fly with the Centaur is shown here to Venus. We can also go to Mercury. And we can even go inside the orbit of Mercury, cutting the orbit of Venus and Mercury, and get as close as possible to the Sun with a solar probe. This is perhaps one of the most interesting missions which Centaur can fly, since the Sun, after all, is the only fixed star that we will be able to reach in the foreseeable future. Centaur assembly follows a pattern established in production of the Atlas. Many of the same manufacturing tools are used. During this first report period, two Centaur tank structures were in production. This is the aft bulkhead for tank number one. 
Workmen are welding the thrust ring to the bulkhead. It is constructed of heavy gauge steel since it is a test item and not a flight article. The intermediate bulkhead is a double walled divider between the liquid oxygen in the lower tank and liquid hydrogen in the upper tank. Insulating material is applied before these two skins are fitted together. This forms a temperature barrier between the liquid oxygen at minus 297 degrees and the liquid hydrogen at minus 423 degrees. The forward liquid hydrogen tank is constructed of six cylindrical stainless steel skin sections. The major differences between these and Atlas tank sections are in the fittings for attaching accessories and thickness of the skin itself. The Centaur forward bulkhead is patterned after the Atlas aft bulkhead, which can be seen in the background. Payload and nose fairings will be attached to this section. These skins have been optically aligned and tack welded into position. Assemblers are laying out the spot weld pattern for the Heliart welders. This weld pattern was established by tensile and fatigue tests of sample joints. In mid-June, the first Centaur tank went into the major assembly jig. This is the Point Loma test item to be used for propellant tanking and flow tests. The second upper stage tank will be delivered to Pratt & Whitney aircraft in Florida to be used for engine testing. In this production development, Centaur has been handled with Atlas support equipment. For example, in late June, the Point Loma tank was transported and directed into the Atlas hydrostatic test tower with available equipment. Here, the tank is filled with water and pressure tested. This testing was underway on the last day of the report period. From here, the tank moves to final assembly for installation of systems. Centaur materials and components specified by design are subjected to environmental testing. In one such evaluation, engineers recorded the breaking point of Centaur structural steel at various temperatures. For these tests, the material samples were sealed into a small chamber. The specimen runs through the chamber with a portion extending from each end. Liquid nitrogen is used to pre-cool the specimen and its container. Hooks within the tank provide attach points for the steel. Liquid hydrogen at 423 degrees below zero is injected into the casing which surrounds the material. This simulates one environmental extreme to which structural metals will be subjected in flight. Gaseous hydrogen formed within the chamber escapes through a vent pipe. Specimens varied in gauge and hardness, from annealed to half-hard to fully hard stainless steel. Controlling factor was temperature, recorded from thermocouples within the test tank. A hydraulic actuator stretched each sample until it reached the breaking point. By a comparison with similar tests made at room temperature, engineers were able to determine the effect of liquid hydrogen on structural metals and seams. Results verified design computations. At the Antenna Design Laboratory, an improved upper stage antenna responded satisfactorily to initial tests. A miniature Centaur tank was attached to a positioning boom. A scale model of the tracking beacon antenna was mounted on this tank. This antenna is both a receiving and transmitting antenna. The boom can raise, lower, or rotate the model to any desired attitude. A facility antenna was used to transmit a modulated signal to the model. The signal is received by the airborne antenna and travels through landlines to the control console. Recordings were made of each test. The problem was to determine the radiation pattern of the antenna and from this establish its best position on the carrier vehicle. The movement of the model simulates the changes in attitude of a satellite in its flight trajectory or in orbit. The trace line is a visual indication of variations in signal intensity as received at the model. This was one of four airborne antennas in development during the report period. The Centaur in orbit will be linked to
to worldwide tracking stations, such as those now operating at the Atlantic Missile Range, Jordal Banks, Manchester, England, Singapore, and Hawaii. An engineering model of the full-scale antenna has been developed and will undergo extensive tests during the second half of 1959. The Point Loma Test Laboratory has been designated as the site for Centaur tests, which require large items of support equipment and for tests involving some degree of hazard. The construction contractor began clearing a site for the Centaur test stand on June 8, 1959. On June 30th, wall forms were in place for the blockhouse. Workmen had set footings for the test tower and storage building. Forms in the foreground outline the position of the test tower. An auxiliary building will provide a shelter for items of test equipment. This was the status on June 30th. The blockhouse will be completed first. Convair personnel will begin installing support equipment in August. Completion is forecast for August 10th, at which time the first Centaur tank will be moved to this site. The Aerophysics Group, with the assistance of Wright Air Development Center, conducted a series of zero-gravity tests at Dayton, Ohio. A modified Convair C-131B, assigned to the Cargo Operations Group, was used for these airborne experiments. A number of different equipment designs were used to determine the behavior of cryogenic or supercooled fluids at zero gravity. The Dewar flasks used are transparent, double-walled vacuum bottles. The test group used liquid nitrogen and freon as working fluids. To achieve zero gravity, the aircraft is maneuvered into a shallow dive about 10 degrees from horizontal. When the proper speed has been attained, the pilot pulls out of the dive. At this point, the positive force is about two and one half Gs. Zero gravity is attained by pushing the aircraft over into a parabolic arc at about 125 knots. When Centaur is in its parking orbit, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen in the tanks will be dispersed due to this phenomenon. The nature of this dispersion was observed by a Convair engineer. The slow motion camera recorded each test, providing a reference for comparing fluid behavior with time, temperature, G loads, and pressures. 150 zero gravity maneuvers were flown for this study. Data will support development of the restart capability of Centaur with the residual propellants in the tanks. Information obtained is also applicable to other space projects. The design group is developing methods for more precise control of load factors not normal to the direction of the flight path. Methods for materially extending the run time at zero gravity are being investigated. The Pratt & Whitney Division of United Aircraft Corporation is the associate contractor for development of the XLR-115 rocket engine. This development is underway at the Florida Research and Development Center near West Palm Beach. Progress here will be summarized by Dick Mulready, project engineer for Pratt & Whitney. It has been known for many years that hydrogen is the ultimate chemical rocket fuel. A graphic comparison of hydrogen with other rocket propellants shows the superior payload capability of hydrogen. Hydrogen-fueled upper stages can substantially increase payload and can make feasible otherwise impossible missions for a given booster. In the past four years, Pratt & Whitney Aircraft has used over four million gallons of liquid hydrogen in development testing. This early experience provides the background necessary for the rapid development of the XLR-115 engine. One feature of the XLR-115 that sets it apart from other engines is the turbopump system. Most current engines have gas generator turbopump systems which burn some of the propellants for operation of the pumps. The XLR-115 turbopump is powered by expanding the hydrogen fuel in the turbine after it has passed through the thrust chamber cooling jacket. The use of this regenerative system permits a compact engine package and improves its efficiency. The hydrogen thrust chamber design is similar to chambers used on the more conventional JP-LOX rocket engines. The 
principal differences are in the cooling flow path and the methods of construction. A furnace braze technique is used to manufacture these thrust chambers. The chamber is sealed in the retort to permit the use of a reducing atmosphere while in the furnace. Rotating the chamber in the furnace gives a uniform heating. This produces a braze consistency and a dimensional control superior to that possible by hand brazing. This plant, adjacent to the test area, was constructed by and is operated by Air Products Corporation under contract to the Air Force. Most of the liquid hydrogen which has been used in the Pratt & Whitney development testing was produced in this plant. Experience has shown that liquid hydrogen can be manufactured, stored and transported in large quantities. The Air Force is currently piping liquid hydrogen to Pratt & Whitney aircraft approximately 1,500 feet in a vacuum jacketed piping system. Storage of the liquid is done indoors, which are vacuum jacketed tanks similar to the home thermos bottle. Rotable doors follow the same pattern of construction. In many ways, liquid hydrogen is less dangerous than gasoline. A hydrogen spill evaporates so rapidly that sustained fires do not occur. As long as ignition is avoided, liquid hydrogen is chemically inert with all common materials around a test stand, including air, oil, and oxygen. It is non-toxic, non-irritating, and non-corrosive. It does not deteriorate or decompose with long-time storage. The test area includes 15 cryogenic component stands. Four large engine test stands and a central control blockhouse were constructed and outfitted completely by Pratt & Whitney aircraft. A fifth stand being constructed jointly by the company and the Air Force will have a capability of static testing a complete space vehicle, including engines and propellant tanks. The blockhouse for the test stand complex contains a complete electronic control system, closed circuit television, and electronic data recording system. These stands are designed to test engines with up to 300,000 pounds thrust. The diffuser provides the means by which we can simulate high altitudes without expensive environmental test chambers. This is necessary with the XLR-115 engine, which has an expansion ratio of 40 to 1. This testing facility was operational and the first thrust chamber was actually tested less than seven months from the date of contract. The first engine test was a checkout of the injector using the workhorse thrust chamber, April 11, 1959. First firing of the injection cooled production engine was conducted May 8th. This, the final test of the report period, was conducted on June 20th. Pressure on. Order's on ready. Engine performance was satisfactory. Centaur will fly from the Atlantic Missile Range, Cape Canaveral, Florida. The flight schedule calls for one launch per month, beginning with first flight in late December 1960.